Yes. We are all set. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. It's a it's a real pleasure to be able to to talk at this conference. Uh, sorry that it cannot be uh, in Lausanne, but uh, certainly. Uh, Another time, it will be a pleasure to join to Lausanne. Um, I, I want to also mention that I am uh, dedicating this talk to uh, a great friend of mine whom, uh, who passed away a few weeks ago, who is uh, Miguel Angel Virazoro, who is very well known in uh, various fields of theoretical physics. He has a, an, an algebra, the Virazoro algebra, his name his, has his, carries his name because it's so important. And um, and I must say that we started working together long, long, long ago on spin glasses. And um, so today I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the various approaches of statistical physics in machine learning, and try especially to underline some of the of the limitations. If I if I want to go back to history long ago, that was a big um, movement of. Uh, physicists working on uh, on machine learning and neural networks as, as it was called at that time uh, around the, the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s and one of the example is was this uh, conference organized in Carges in 1992 by Peter Grasberger and Jean-Pierre Nadal and uh, just to give you an idea of what was taking place at that moment, it was a, uh, there was a lot of excitement. People from completely different communities were, were meeting and trying to understand each other, together with the neuroscientists, together with people uh, uh, more in statistics, uh, and so on. So here are here is the list of the of the part not of the participants but of the contributors to the conference who have produced a paper. In the in the proceedings, and uh, you can see a, a very diverse list of, uh, of scientists that you probably recognize a, a few a few of them. Let me also uh, mention uh, sadly the name of uh, Naftali Tishbi, who was contributing here and also passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I will I will um, I want to have a talk giving a kind of high level view on uh, what was the situation at that time, what has changed since then, what can statistical physics bring to the field, maybe also what it cannot bring to the field, and what are the principal points that are blocking progress, and that may be the thing which, which I find the most interesting. I should also say I, I am not able to, to look simultaneously at the at the chat and at the talk and then so on. So if someone wants to ask questions, you are mostly most welcome. But uh, if someone can have a look at the chat and tell me, look, there is a question on this, so that, that would be fine. And uh, so yeah. no problem, no problem. You will yeah. do it. Yes, good, yes. good. Thank you. So um, let me mention a little bit. If I if I go back to the situation at that time, it was a, a time when there was a big progress on uh, on spin glasses. Spin glasses they are magnetic materials. So this is in some sense the archetype of what statistical physics can do or, or not do, uh, which is um, if you have so if you have a system of spins, spins can point up or down in the simplest situation. Let's say they are two level systems, quantum spins. And so they take two states, and the energy of the spin depends on the on their interaction. So if you have two neighboring spins in a ferromagnet like here, any two neighboring spin on a lattice, the energy is lower when the spins point in the same direction. And uh, Boltzmann taught us that at equilibrium at a given temperature, the uh, the probability of a, of a set of spins is given by the Boltzmann weight e to the minus beta the energy. So if you are at very low temperature. You see that minimizing the energy means that all the spins should point in the same direction. The big, big surprise in some sense that, that was one of the challenge of the, of the statistical physics uh, historically was um, that there could be abrupt transition, that it was not a gradual freezing of the spin, but there was some critical temperature where the, where the, the alignment takes place. And, um, let me mention one of the tools, because I will tell you a little bit about the tools from statistical physics. One of them is, is just a mean field. So mean fields amounts to looking at a self-consistent equation for the spins. 
uh, if you look at the spin SI you, and the, the expectation value of SI denoted by this bracket, expectation with respect to the measure, to the Boltzmann measure, assume that it is equal to M. It is easy to show that in general, the expectation value of SI is equal to, oh, here, sorry, there is an expectation value missing, to the expectation value of the tanch of the sum of JIJSJ of all its neighbors. And you approximate that by tanch z, the number of neighbors, j, the coupling, and m. And this is the famous Weiss equation, Curie Weiss equation. And if you solve this equation, you find that you can develop a spontaneous magnetization. This, I should say, is, is a very nice example of a collective behavior. It's something that you cannot see if you have only five spins or 10 spins. You need to have a large number of them for the probability to, to be really picked on this, uh, on this uh, solution. Now, the big, the big move of the, of the 80s was to generalize all this approach to spin glasses. Spin glasses, it is the same. You have spins there in two states and so on. The only difference is that, for instance, if you have manganese into copper, the manganese carries spin, they are impurities, they are located at random position. And depending on the dis distance between them, the interaction can be either favoring the minimum of energy of two spin can be either aligning them or anti-aligning them. And this creates, so it is the same energy, except that this Jij depends on the pair you are looking at. Some of it's positive, some of it's negative. And then uh, you see that immediately there are many questions that, that appear. First of all, you have a sample here. The sample is defined by the position of the manganese. The, ma the position of the manganese defines the JIJ. Well, the, the interaction depends on the distance. So for each sample, you have a probability measure. And, uh, and so uh, this immediately creates an enormous uh, complication because you see we are, I should say that we are also dealing with uh, samples which have typically uh, a size of the Avogadro number. So 10 to the 23 uh, spins uh, interacting. Uh, and so, and you have a, a kind of formidable task, which is to understand what happens when you have 10 to the 23 spins interacting with JIJ, which depend on the sample. And so uh, that was, uh, that was uh, in some sense, uh, the, the big challenge. And uh, the, the uh, spin glass uh, was uh, then modeled and uh, the famous uh, step for, on this was done by, by um, Sherrington and Kirkpatrick, defining a model in which the JIJ, the coupling, are normal distributed with the mean J0 over n and a variance which is J squared over n. Sorry. Uh, so, this I insist on, on it, I will insist a lot on this question of ensemble. That is, if you look at an a spin glass, you don't look at one spin glass, you look at an ensemble of spin glass. The ensemble is what? It's a probability distribution over what we call sample. A sample is a set of manganese impurities at a certain position. You want to understand this sample. But it turns out that this sample, you have generated the manganese and impurities, you can generate another sample. It turns out that they behave roughly the same. So they are not exactly the same. The JIJ is different, but they are drawn from a certain probability distribution, which is called the ensemble. So you want to understand the behavior of an ensemble. And in most cases, and I will, I will insist a lot in the, in the following, in most cases, the ensemble is just IID variables. So in the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, the JLJ are ID Gaussian. So for one given sample, one given set of couplings J, you can define the free energy, which is the log of the partition function. Sorry, the partition function is this normalizing uh, quantity, the normalization of the probability distribution. And the free energy is, is uh, it, it's extensive, it's proportional to the size, to the 10 to the 23, to the number of, of uh, variables. So uh, the intensive part is just uh, minus one over beta, that's conventional. It's one over the size times the log of the partition function. And the important thing is that um, typically what happens in spin glasses and in many, many, many disordered systems is that there is a large deviation property. It means that if you look at uh, uh, all the possible samples that you generate the J at random, or each sample you will generate a certain free energy density, F sub J. And uh, the probability of finding a sample with free energy density F is e to the N times a certain function phi of F. 
So almost all uh, samples have, uh, uh, so the, the, sorry, the, fu the function phi of f is typically concave. So it will have a maximum at a value f star. So it means that basically in the thermodynamic limit when n is very large, you see that almost all samples, they have the same free energy density, which is f star. And that explains why when you do an experiment on a spin glass sample, you do it uh, in, uh, here in, in Cortona, you do it at Lausanne and you do it in Paris and you take different samples, but you have had the same procedure for generating sample, you will get the same result basically. So the, the whole, there is one method, I will I just give you a hint of two or three of the main methods that we are using. One of the main methods is the replica. The replica method, you can see it as a way to reconstruct the large deviation function phi of f. That is, Basically, the idea is the following. Uh, imagine that you are able to compute the expectation value, expectation value with respect to the, the choice of the sample of the partition function to the power n. Well, the partition function is e to the minus beta f. So z to the n is e to the minus small n beta f. And then there is, of course, you, you can see how many samples have the free energy density small f. This is e to the capital N phi of f. And so you see that in the large, oh, sorry, there is a large N and a small N. The large N is the size of the system, the number of spins. The small N is the number of replicates. So in the large size sample limit, large capital N, then you can do that by, by saddle point. And then you will find that uh, you, you will have access basically to the, to the to the free energy density when the number of replicas goes to zero. So it's a way to reconstruct this large deviation function. There are also several other interpretations that I will not try to, to mention here. Okay. Um, another very important approach is the generalization of the vice uh, approach of the mean field approach that I was saying before. Uh, basically, what happens in a spin glass is that you have a homogeneous system. That is, each spin sees a different environment for all the other, from all the other spins. And so uh, you have to construct a set of uh, self-consistent uh, mean field equations. It cannot be just one single equation. It is a number of variables, which is the number of spins. So this is uh, usually uh, complicated, but basically it amounts to uh, developing uh, to what has been done in uh, independent contexts, in the context of error correcting codes on the one hand by Gallagher, in the context of uh, inference on the other hand by Perl, etc. And um, these are message passing algorithms, basically. That is uh, the one way to understand it is to say, imagine that you dig a cavity, you erase one edge, the edge between uh, spin i and spin j, and you look at the local field on i, this is the local field of i in the absence of j, and you can uh, compute it as a function of the local field on its neighbors in the absence of i. This is the, the what is called the BP equation, beta piles equation or belief propagation equation. And so solving these equations, again, uh, I, I want to insist on one, one important point that uh, when we encounter these kind of equations in the, in the spin glass context, we will not never thought of using them as, a, as an algorithm just before, because there is no point in using that as an algorithm. You would have a, a sample again is 10 to the 20 something variable. So there's no, no way that you can ever write these equations. And in the end, you don't want to understand one given sample. You want to understand the common properties which are common to all samples. And so what we tried to develop was, uh, it's called the cavity method is what are the statistical properties of the solution to these equations? That is, and you have statistical properties depending on what is the edge you're looking at, i in the absence of j, k in the absence of i, et cetera, and what are the statistical properties with respect to the sample-to-sample -sample fluctuations? In particular, the phase diagram that has been obtained in terms of the temperature, which is one of the parameters of beta appearing in the, uh, in the uh, Boltzmann weight, and J naught, which is the mean of the of the, of the couplings, is has has this form. At high temperature, typically the system is paramagnetic, and at low temperature it becomes a spin glass. And in a spin glass, basically what happens is that you can get 
many solutions to these mean field equations. You can have the system can set up in a polar, spontaneous polarization of the spins, which can have various values. And um, so this is often uh, shown as a, as a kind of landscape in which the usual ferromagnet that I was mentioning before, you have just two valleys, two possible ground state of the energy, basically plus or minus M because there is a symmetry. And in the spin glass, you have a very large number of them. They are organized in a, in a, a very peculiar structure called ultrametric. They are unrelated by symmetry. So all this is part of what, what, uh, what was found at the, uh, in the 80s. And it's starting from that, that there was this excitement about neural network. And let me explain to you why. Certainly, uh, it all started from the paper of John Hopfield. John Hopfield, who proposed to look at a, at a system as new type of memories, uh, new type of memories which are content addressable. And, uh, and his system was exactly a spin glass. That is, it is the neurons are, mo are modeled as a two state system. A neuron is either at rest and it is in state minus one or it is spiking, it is sending a, a wave of depolarization along its axon, and then it is a state which is plus one. The energy of interaction of the various neurons depends on the, on the pairs, and it depends on the uh, JIJ is the synaptic efficacy, the efficacy of the synapse between neuron I and neuron J. And the main difference, and, and, and the Boltzmann weight is the same as in spinning glass. The main difference is this one. Except of having JIJ, which are IID, as in a spin glass, you have a different ensemble. Your ensemble is that you build the interaction in the following way. That was the proposal of, of Hopfield, was to use the Heb rule. And the Heb rule is to say that you have a certain number of preferred configurations of neurons, which we call patterns. And these patterns, let's say that there are P such patterns, capital P, and uh, for each such pattern is an active set of activity of the n neurons, xi i mu. So i runs from one to capital N, mu goes from one to p. And the coupling, he decides to take the coupling as the average of sum of xi i mu, xi j mu. It turns out that, so it is only a change of ensemble. You see, the only thing that, that, that changes is the probability distribution of the couplings, but it is also the probability distribution, of course, of all the samples. Now, in this new setting, what happens is that because of this different ensemble, the whole physics of it, the whole phenomenology is completely different. Well, here we had at low temperature, many pure states unrelated by symmetry, completely random. Here at low temperature in the Hopfield model, what you have is that at low temperature, and if the number of patterns is not too large, then the spin will polarize in the direction of the, one of the patterns. So it means that basically you have tailored, you have coined the, the, the energy in such a way that these minima of the energy here, they correspond, they are very close to the memorized pattern, to the pattern that you want to memorize. So you have a system of spins whose dynamics at low temperature spontaneously will set up in one of these wells, which are the memorized patterns. And if you start from the configuration, which is not too far from one of the memorized pattern, that is, that's where it's content addressable. You, have, you, you start from something which has some element of the memorized pattern, then you will fall on it rapidly in a, a, a thermal dynamic of such a system. So um, you see, because of, of this, um, this new model of Hopfield, one understands a tractor neural network as new types of memories understand the phase diagram, understand where is the critical capacity. One understands also that if there are too many patterns to be memorized, then everything is blurred and you lose the whole information. So uh, one of the main uh, uh, impact of this research was to bring the attention of, of a lot of colleagues on, on this kind of, of problems. And uh, it partic in particular, it renewed the attention on the building block of this, which is a perceptron, which is how a person, how a single neuron uh, uh, acts in such in such a, uh, a system. Uh, 
And uh, in parallel with all that, there was a, another movement of, uh, of colleagues doing feed-forward neural networks trained with backpropagation for learning a task. All this was, a, a, as I said, an enormous uh, excitement, but um, it was followed by many interesting developments at the interface with neuroscience. But most of the people who were in this uh, big movement of the big hype of the end of the 80s on, this, uh, on these uh, systems, they gave, up, they gave up with the applications and uh, they gave up because, because all this did not really uh, work in terms of application. So I will go very fast on this slide because everybody in this audience knows that uh, better than me. It is uh, some of the examples of the enormous, incredible progress that took place in the last 10, 15 years on the practical side. So that is what I call the decade of technological revolution. And this technological revolution of, of machine learning, it, it is just using uh, some of these systems that were studied already at that time, that is feed forward neural networks in which you have an input, and it goes to a second layer, third layer, etc. At each layer, you have a, a, you apply a linear matrix, which uh, gives you uh, the application of the weight, and then a nonlinear function. All this can depend. The nonlinear function will also depend on the layer, of course. And you have component-wise nonlinearities at each point. And then the nonlinear function can take various uh, various forms. And what you want to learn are the weights, the, the, what I called before the synaptic weights. And um, so we are just using here all the ingredients that were there 30 years ago, which is use feed forward neural networks, trained with gradient descent learning, implemented with backpropagation. All this was present. Uh, the new things are the availability of, of very, availability of very large database, the larger computing power, the which allows to use much deeper networks. And the number of tricks, uh, and here, uh, let me mention, I, I'm not saying, I mean, trick in my, in, in the way that I use it, there is nothing pejorative in using trick. I mean, uh, the trick can be something very astute. And uh, actually these tricks, they, uh, they are accumulated uh, experience. I always say that it is an art. That is how you decide on what is the network, what depth, what width, how, how many, how many layers, or what kind of type of layers you use, local convolution, what kind of activation function, etc. Early stopping, transfer learning, all these tricks, they may they they are they provide a whole framework which is incredibly efficient and which is leading this technological revolution. Now I must say that uh, from the point of view of someone who looks at it a bit from far with uh, some, some perspective, the theory is, is badly lagging behind because uh, as I was saying, there was all this pro progress technologically and no problem, not so much progress uh, um, theoretically. One question that I could ask is, look, when, imagine that you have tried, uh, you, have, you have taught uh, you have been training a network of this type, like the one that I, I drew here at uh, run. I picked up one at random, more or less. And you have trained it on a very good database and so on and so forth. And it does exactly the task that you want it to do. It, uh, it uh, distinguishes uh, cats from dogs or whatever you like to do. You know everything on this network. You can Maybe it has one million weights. You know each single weight uh, with uh, the accuracy that you want. Uh, you know what the thing is doing, and basically you don't know exactly what it is doing. You don't know exactly why it is working. Uh, so this is what I say uh, always, that in some sense, you have a system which is a neuroscientist dream, as if uh, you have a neuroscientist which is able to look in the brain and say this uh, synapse has this efficacy, this other synapse has that efficacy, and so on. It has all this knowledge, but if with this knowledge, it's impossible to reconstruct what is really the, the, the thing. Doing. So there are many questions uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, some of the main, uh, the most salient one, which uh, everybody has in mind is, uh, why is it that training is possible at all? Uh, that is, you train uh, with a million weights, you are in a million uh, dimensional uh, uh, space with highly non-convex function. 
you should encounter the curse of dimensionality. You should have one of these spin glass landscape that I was showing before, in which we know that it is hard to, to find a solution. And here, you don't seem to get trapped in the glass trap. So this is a question of landscape, and there are many people working on that. And uh, you have also the, the, the question of generalization. Why can you get into the regime in which you have many more parameters than data? and still generalize well and don't have the phenomenon of overfitting. So many ingredients, the architecture, which is the art, the algorithms, which also in some sense is the art and the structure of the data. What can statistical physics bring? Uh, it can bring, um, on the one hand, uh, an, uh, statistical physics has been conceived and built in order to to explain emergent properties. What happens at large size? What happens if you are in a very big system? So with, the, with deep networks entering the, the, the sizes of, uh, of millions of parameters and so on, we are not yet at the size of 10 to the 23, but still we are in a regime in which one can hope to have, a, you have emergent properties actually. And so this is what, what maybe can, can be explained. Uh, in particular, the kind of weird, problems or weird behaviors that can, uh, that can appear uh, in the thermodynamic limit, like the phase transitions. The, um, the whole experience about uh, loss or energy landscapes in large dimensions, the tool and concepts for empirical analysis, and in general, uh, a way of handling probabilities in large dimension, and also dynamical systems. So I will, I will uh, start from it, and I, what I want to do now is I will insist a bit on, on the, I will go back to the perceptron itself because it will give me, perceptron is a building block in some sense of all this accumulated knowledge. And I want to insist on, on, on what are the various crucial elements when you study the perceptron and also to find the limitations. And then it will bring me to the, to the discussion of database versus ensembles and structured data and perspectives. So um, the early example and very important building block is the perceptron. The perceptron is a linear classifier. You have data, the data D is a set of inputs which are xi mu, which are n-dimensional vectors and output y mu, which is a single output. And here in the simplest case, it can be just a, a sign. It can be a, a binary variable. And uh, so in the per, I'm very sorry, I am using my notations, which are the one that I have used all my life, which is capital N is the size of the input and capital P is the number of, of is the size of the database. So very often in statistics, the capital P is, is called small N and, uh, and the capital N is, small, is called small P. I leave you the task of uh, translating into your own language. Um, this so the perceptron does the following thing: you have a certain you have n weights here, and the output is a sign of uh, the uh, is a, the sign of w dot xi basically. So the, the perceptron is trying to find a hyperplane orthogonal to the vector w, in which uh, basically the, the the desired patterns which have which have a desired output plus one is on one side and the one which have output minus one is on the other side. This, uh, so in some cases it is possible, other cases it, it is not, and that will be basically uh, whether the person can learn the task or not. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, what happens when your desired output are drawn randomly with probability one half uh, and continuous coupling, an old approach uh, using combinatorics by cover uh, shows that basically you can memorize all the patterns when the number of uh, patterns per neuron, P divided by N, is more than two. So there is a sharp phase transition at alpha equal two. Now let us, let us compare uh, this, uh, this combinatoric result of cover. We compare it to what statistical physics can do, just to understand what is what physics can do and not do, and what it can bring. So, uh, Statfi's approach, uh, pioneered by Gardner in 1988 and many other people, um, I will I will mention four main results. So, first first of all, four main uh, steps in this development. 
The first thing is to look at uh, the weights W and uh, uh, what one will uh, want to compute is the volume of the space of weights of weight. So imagine that the weights are on the sphere. And then you want to know which of these weights satisfy all the constraints. That is, they, they are able to memorize each of the desired pattern mu. And so omega depends on the database, the volume of such weights. In some, in some, in some cases, it may be empty. That is, there is no solution. In other cases, it may be large. In the thermodynamic limit for IID data, the distribution of the log of the volume divided by N concentrates. First of all, it's a, it's a volume. So if the weights you start from sphere in N dimension, and, uh, and then you start to put some constraints on this sphere, typically the volume is of the order E to the N, where N is the number of, uh, of speeds. So the natural quantity is to look at the uh, log of the volume divided by capital N. And so you will have a concentration, you will have a large deviation function, and you will uh, have the fact that for almost all database, when you generate it IID, uh, the, the volume of accessible space is phi tilde. This phi tilde, then you can use the trick that I was mentioning before. This is also, you, you know, the, another, uh, that, that was our trick, which was uh, the replica trick. I explained to you that it was able to compute the large deviation function, in particular, the maximum of the large deviation function, which is the most, uh, the, the typical value of the free energy. So you can compute this phi tilde. Its value depends on the ratio, the ratio P divided by N, and it depends on kappa. Kappa is the stability. It is the margin by which you want to, to, to stabilize the pattern, by which you want to learn the pattern. That is, you want to, you want that uh, not only W dot psi mu has the right sign, but W of psi mu must also be as large as possible, and if possible, larger than a certain threshold kappa. And you can compute analytically the threshold, and this is the threshold. And then you can also, from that on, using the other trick that I was mentioning before, which is a cavity method, you can compute, you can derive an algorithm for learning the weights. So this is the result for the perceptron with the margin. You have the value of alpha c depending on, depending on the size of the margin. Of course, if the margin is large, then it is harder to, harder to, to, to learn and the capacity decreases. Now I want to, as I said, I want to look at all these critical steps one by one. There are four of them, and I want to explain what they, what what one is doing in statistical physics at each of these steps, in order to understand uh, the, the 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 strength and limitation. So the first step was to uh, use these set weights which are the fraction of the sphere such that all constraints are satisfied. So what you do here is, a, is really two things. First of all, you start from an initial measure. In this case, the initial measure is uniform on the sphere. So you, have, you put these constraints, sum of wa squared called n. You have a sphere of radius square root of n. And this is your, your working space. And you assume, and that is a kind of prior. Your prior is that the weights, the weights of your perceptron a priori, they are uniformly distributed in the sphere. And then you put for each pattern that you want to memorize, you put these constraints that the output y mu, which is plus or minus one, times the dot product of the weight and the pattern, w dot xi mu, should be larger than the margin kappa. So this creates a measure. The measure is the product of a prior, which is uniform, and some evidence coming from the uh, various constraints from the various patterns that you want to, to memorize. And so uh, you look at this measure, and this is a measure that you study with, uh, that you will be able to study with replicas and so on. Second step, thermodynamic limit. Um, what you need for that is you need an ensemble of data. So here, for instance, uh, all the computation was done, what I was explaining before. It was done on a certain data, on an ensemble of data, which I have to define how I generate the patterns and the desired output. In this case, uh, the whole computation is correct when you take uh, IID patterns, that is, each component of each pattern is IID, with uh, an, uh, an expectation value which is zero, and the expectation value of xi squared, the variance is equal to one. And the output is plus or minus one with probability one half. 
So this is your ensemble. If you have this ensemble, then with respect to this ensemble, there is a large deviation function. And it means that phi of D, the one over N log of the volume of the SAT configurations concentrates. Almost all uh, databases have the same value of the volume. Third step, the replica computation. So the replica computation is, uh, I, will, I will not repeat it. I, I just sketch it very uh, briefly uh, above. Uh, what I can say is that once you have the correct measure and the correct ensemble, the replica uh, is a very powerful analytical tool. It gives a very precise result. Here you see I could, it was simple enough that I could write it on this screen. In many other applications, these are a bit longer formulas that you don't dare to write, but they exist and they are perfectly uh, uh, under control. It is also generalizable to other weights. So for instance, instead of having weights which are uniform on the sphere, I can have them uniform on the hypercube. That is my prior measure would be wi equal plus or minus one. Uh, you have all the hypercube and I take then the pieces of the hypercube which, are, uh, the, the, which satisfy all constraints. This changes everything, for instance, uh, it is known that uh, in that case, the capacity, even at zero margin, instead of being capacity equal to two, it becomes equal to 0.83. It's, uh, you have to solve uh, an integral equation to give it, to, to get this. I should also emphasize that it is a fully controlled method, but it is not rigorous. So it has a kind of status of educated conjecture. And in some cases, and in particular, when you have a Bayesian optimal approach, then you could, it's possible to prove the result of the replica method by interpolation methods. These methods that have been famously introduced by Guerra Toninelli, uh, developed by Talagran, Barbier, Macris, et cetera, et cetera. There are many people that, I, that should be uh, cited here. Last piece, the cavity AMP and algorithm. Um, this uh, initially, uh, when, when dealing with the perceptron, I was looking at it uh, long ago, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, when you look at this problem here, you can look at it in terms of a, a factor graph, which is described here. That is, you have the weight, each, each weight WEI as a certain uh, uh, measure. And then you have the interaction psi mu i between W and the constraint mu. The constraint mu is this thing here. From starting from this factor graph, you can write the belief propagation equation, project them because they are in the large n limit, they become Gaussian messages. So you get a Gaussian projection and you close the equation in the first and second moment of these messages. It turns out that in the large n limit, you can do even another simplification, which is going to what we call a TAP equation. That is basically you, you will close the equation on the means and variance of the weight of the weights W. This is AMP and its generalization, GAMP, and so on. And uh, uh, this is very, very successful. And, and this is fully under control in the case of the perceptron. So just to summarize, what you need for the statphys approach, you need a measure, you need an ensemble, and you will get a detailed description and an algorithm. This is, this is nice, uh, but you need a, a relatively simple measure on one hand, a very simple ensemble, I will insist on that, and then, and then you get all these, all these results. So uh, in machine learning, you will do the same. So now you, I, I, I will go away from the, from the perceptron and look a, a bit from uh, a bit further in, in machine learning, deeper in machine learning. And, uh, and you have a, a database, input psi mu, output y mu. Uh, you, have an, you implement a function y equal a function of w and psi. W are all the set of parameters. I may, you may be, might have hundreds of layers if you want. And uh, you want to find the w that optimizes some kind of loss function. Or you could use Bayesian learning in which you have explicitly a prior on the weights and then a Boltzmann weight that is in at large beta, you will uh, concentrate on uh, weights which satisfy all the constraints. And, and once you have generated the optimal weights, you want to generalize and measure the generalization. So let me uh, insist a little bit on one crucial point, which is the, the notion of database and ensemble. Uh, 
in most of the practical developments so far, uh, people are, are starting from a database. So historically, uh, one of the first one was a NIST, and then you have whatever you want to, you have sci-fi, all kind of all kind of databases that have been uh, that have been invented. And uh, in some sense, from my point of view of, a, of a theoretical physics, it was always something very frustrating to 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 see results in which people say, "I have looked at this database, and I have looked at this architecture." And they get this result because uh, it's hard to understand what is the generality. Generality. I mean, one can, and I, I do admire the quality of the results very often, but it's very hard to understand what one gets from it in terms of theory, in terms of a, of a common scheme. So instead, uh, physics will rely a lot, and not only physics, a lot of the, of the other theoretical approach. Uh, will we'll rely a lot on the notion of ensemble. That is, you will assume that you have an ensemble P of Xi from which you draw your, your, the patterns in your database. And you have a target output with known function. And uh, uh, you, will, you, will, you will assume that the desired output could be F, uh, F hat of Xi mu, or maybe F hat of Xi mu, a, noise, or a noisy version of it. But it is a very different. Uh, um, it is a very different setup, of course. Well, the purist will tell me, but it is the same because uh, on the left-hand side, you just define the P of Xi, which is just uh, which has just a delta peak on each of the image of the database, and that's one possible probability distribution. So, uh, yes, of course, but uh, in my in my mind, at least, the P of Xi, which is here should be relative, which should be uh, smooth enough that it is not just defined by, by a list, but it has some regularity. And uh, it can be parameterized by, by a certain number of parameters, which is not uh, uh, infinitely large. So uh, the old example of the, of the database, which, uh, so if you have a database, you can start to do physics. You have an ensemble, you can have the, the large deviation function, you can use all the, all the tricks that I was showing before. So uh, if you have a teacher, it generates some parameters, let's say, uh, that, that is a setup that was, uh, that was uh, done for, for, uh, for understanding learning and generalization in the perceptron. So you imagine that you have a teacher that knows, so that has a certain set of weights, W tilde. And, it, and the teacher generates the output value of the perceptron, the desired output, by the sign of the uh, dot product of W tilde and the input. This is what you design. And then you have, you have, and so it is a linear separator in a direction with a hyperplane perpendicular to W tilde. And the student came with the same architecture and he wants to learn the weight W. Of course, if, the, if, if in the learning W converges to W tilde, you will have the perfect student, that is, it will be able to generalize perfectly. So when you uh, when you you can do exactly the same thing that is you have the, the, the with respect to what I was presenting before on the perceptron the main difference is the fact that you have the, the desired output y mu is given by the sign of w tilde dot xi mu so these are the, this is the, uh, there is an underlying direction of the of the in the space of, of weights, and uh, the results which have been known to, uh, for 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 since uh, 1990 is that there is a phase transition to perfect generalization. Uh, uh, maybe it's better to see it on the figure. So this is a generalization error as a function of alpha. Alpha is p divided by n. There are basically two phase transition. Uh, at uh, 1.25, you have the bias optimal phase transition. That is, in principle, when you have enough patterns, uh, more than 1.25 times n patterns, then you should your measure is concentrated on W equal W tilde. And so you, you should be able to generalize perfectly. And the generalization error, the theoretical one, jumps to zero. If you look at the... At the uh, belief propagation or GAMP algorithm, what you will find is that it jumps to zero at another value, which is close to 1.5. So it means that um, here below 1.25, you don't have enough information and there is no way 
that you can learn the task. Above 1.5, you can learn the task and it is easy to do. And in fact, a simple message passing does it. And in the intermediate phase, it is hard. And blue points here just show what logistic regression would do in such a task. You can do that instead of binary uh, weights, you can have also continuous weight, for instance, uh, Gauss Bernoulli, and then you find that the bias optimal uh, and, and, uh, and the message passing uh, give the, the, right, uh, the right result. So this was a whole set of study. In the 90s, there was a lot of developments putting two layers. And basically what can be done is uh, the, the approach that was done so far was limited by two main obstacles. One is the ensemble. The whole approach is done for IID or Gaussian patterns, input patterns. And the other, on the other hand, you can generalize it to what is called committee machines or things like that, in which you have an input layer, you have an intermediate layer, and an output layer. So people were very happy with that because, of course, the Purcell prone has its limitation of being a linear separator. As soon as you have an intermediate layer, it's much better. But then you are basically limited to the case in which the number of units in the hidden layer, K, is finite. Uh, it means that the number of learnable weights, the weights that you learn, which are here and there, they are of the order k times n on this side and k here. So they are, they are of order n. And then you can get all these nice results and generalize it to this, uh, to this setup. So when I say that theory is lagging behind, I would like to say that the theory in the 90s was lagging badly behind because on the one hand you had in the theoretical approaches, you would have typically approach based on uh, bounds, that is VC dimension, uh, Rademacher complexity, etc., which gives you a uniform bound between a generalization and training error in an ensemble. It is, it is clearly a uniform bound, so it, it, is, it is based, it is dominated by the worst case. And, uh, and, it, and it is strongly related to the capacity of classification with random labels. So it happens that it is just not at all relevant for practical situations. On the other hand, the statistical physics approach has its own limitations. It is limited to a, a structure in which you have only the input layer is extensive of, of large n, and the others do not. And, uh, and it is also able to handle only unstructured data. So the recent direction and perspective that I want to mention in the last five minutes are, uh, on the one hand, the probabilistic ensemble of structured data. So um, if you look at, uh, at the NIST database, these are patterns which are in 784 dimensions, but not all the black and white pictures in 784 pixels look like uh, handwritten digits. I mean, here you have uh, one handwritten digits and a lot of, uh, of garbage uh, on, the, on the other hand. And so you can, you can try to understand what is the structure of the, of the, of the subspace of in this 700 something dimensional space, the subspace of handwritten digits. And you look at NIST and there is a, a nice tool that was invented by Grasberger and Procaccia, which is to say, well, if, it, if the handwritten digits lie on a manifold of, of dimension D, then if you look at the number of points neighbor to a given point uh, with a, a radius R, it should grow like R to the D. And so it tells you that the nearest neighbor distance should scale like uh, uh, p, the number of the total number of points, to the power mi minus one over d. So you can look at that for MNIST, and you will find that it, uh, the MNIST database, the digits, they lie in an effective manifold of dimension 15. And you can look a bit more closely and find that the digit number five itself lies in a manifold of dimension 12. Digit number one is in a manifold of dimension seven or eight, depending on how you compute it. Two is in a manifold dimension 12 or 13, et cetera, et cetera. So the MNIST problem is you have a 15 dimensional manifold of 100 digits, and you want to identify the 10 perceptual sub manifolds associated with each digit of dimension between seven and 13. This is, this is a nice way to recast the problem because it tells you about the low dimensionality of the data. 
I mean, if you want to train a network on this, this is on what you are training it. You are not training it on arbitrary 784 dimensional uh, uh, space. So this is a very important ingredient. And I think that and understanding better the shape of the manifold should be also very important. I mean, here we have just done the, the uh, only the, the nearest neighbor distance or variance of it have been done to find the dimension, but there are many other properties of the manifold that should be important. The same applies to any kind of database. And in Cypher 10, you find that uh, the manifold is dimension 35, for instance. So uh, one, uh, one direction is to try to build ensembles which have this idea of a, of a, of a hidden manifold of the, of the space. That is one way to do that is to have latent space variables, which can be IID, from which you generate the data. So the latent space is in, in a space of dimension capital D, and you use them to build the data in a space of dimension capital N. So they will build a manifold of dimension D in a space of dimension N. And then the, you can use the latent variables to build the, to, to define the label. So uh, this is a way to try to, to define a structured, a structured ensemble. Uh, one way to do it that we have been looking at is uh, basically to have a linear manifold, that is, you look at a linear d-dimensional manifold in your n-dimensional space and apply a pointwise nonlinearity on each component in parallel. And so you will fold it by this nonlinearity. Uh, this um, you can it happens that this can be this can be studied in quite some detail, and uh, and you can generalize the, a lot of the statphys result to these cases of uh, manifold structured data. You can go even more than that because instead of just having uh, the the linear manifold folded once by a nonlinear function applied uh, component wise, you can fold it several times by using a generator network. You start from latent variables, and then from these latent variables, you will go through a generator network, like a, a, a GAN network, so that it will generate something which looks like, a, like an image that you want to, to find. And, uh, uh, and uh, again, uh, you can use that through a feature map in order to generate, you have, you have some structured data, which has been generated from underlying latent variables, which are IID in a, in a smaller dimension space. So you can generalize the statfix fees program that I was mentioning to the hidden manifold data. This can be done. Uh, for instance, you can take this famous uh, two layer uh, uh, committee machine and with learnable ways W and V and generalize what was done before. Instead of having X, the input, which is IID, you have an X, which is structured, which is the corresponds to data coming from a hidden manifold. And uh, uh, this is also very intimately related. The way that we generated the manifold is very related to the, to the random features, because basically uh, our way of going from the, um, the latent data, the latent uh, uh, representation, the, the C uh, going from that to X, it was applying a linear uh, function that was my linear manifold and then a non-linearity non component wise. And that is the same as projecting in a larger dimension space from uh, fixed random features. So um, you can study that analytically uh, in, in quite a large uh, generality because of a, of a Gaussian equivalence theorem that can be proved uh, precisely in the setting in which uh, the, if the input has been generated just by one uh, layer of generator network. If in the case of deep hidden manifolds, if you generate the X through several layers of hidden manifolds, it turns out that there is also a Gaussian equivalent property in the sense that the local fields arriving, local fields applied to this, so the local input on these neurons, they are jointly Gaussian. Uh, but uh, while we can generalize, when we, while we can prove this Gaussian theorem when there is only one layer of generator, when there are many layers, we, it's just a conjecture. But it seems to hold very, very well. So, um, this is just to tell you an example of, uh, of learning. Uh, 
uh, with uh, 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 GAN-generated data, just to show you that you can control the thing fully. You can use all the tricks uh, used before with uh, statistical physics, uh, replica, cavity, and uh, online learning. You can use them in this context. So um, what we have done so far is, uh, and I will finish uh, very soon with that, we have generalized from IID or Gaussian patterns to uh, structured data of a certain type. I'm not saying that it is the last word. I think that there will be a lot of developments in that direction and they are needed. The second question, which is, can we go beyond this structure in which we had only order and learnable weights? Uh, this is a, a, what I call the deep challenge. That is generalize the statistics approach to order and square learnable weights. That is, imagine that you have here a structure like this one. And uh, and you want, and all the weights are learnable. So far, we don't know how to do that. We know how to use a multi-layer linear estimator. For instance, if you have an output y, which is given by this network here, and if you know the observation y and you know the weights and you want to reconstruct x, then this is very well controlled. This is a kind of generalization of the compressed sensing, and we know how to do that. But it is a case in which the number of unknowns x is of size n, not of size n squared. So the challenge is, is to understand, uh, to understand the, the deep case. And the missing building block really is this one. I mean, if, you, if I look at one slice of the learnable weights, I will have a case in which I have a, a, an input, an output, and the weights. And basically, uh, there is a, a problem which is clo closely related and which we so should be able to solve first before going further, which is given Y and some priors on X and W, can you reconstruct X and W? This is a matrix, matrix factorization or the dictionary learning problem. It had been studied using all our methods with the replica and the cavity and so on. Uh, but unfortunately, this early attempt uh, going back to 2014 is incorrect. We know that it is incorrect. We know why. And, but we don't yet know the solution to this problem. All the work is in progress in that direction with uh, people, uh, Antoine, Maya, Florent, Zakala, and Lenkas de Brova, who are all in this, uh, in this room. And you can ask them questions during the break. Uh, so I think this is a very important building block. It should be solved first, and then we can start to elaborate from that. Uh, I have a last remark. I will not uh, comment on the, on the figures because I am late, but uh, I want to mention that uh, contacts with neuroscience, it was always very instructive, and I remind it uh, already from several decades ago. Uh, it turns out that in recent years, the structured activity of neurons and the fact that the activity, the relevant activity of neurons for a given task lies in a low dimensional manifold. It is a very active field of research in neuroscience. So here is a case of a rat, which is trained. I, I took really the latest uh, example that I have from this uh, from last week in nature and a rat trained to a, a virtual cognitive task uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of video game. And, uh, and you understand that the representation of the world and of the task takes place uh, uh, they image uh, 3,000 something uh, neurons, and they uh, they realize that the whole understanding of the world takes place in a five-dimensional uh, sub-manifold of the activity. So this, I think, is uh, is another point of contact with neuroscience, which certainly will be worth uh, exploring. Uh, sorry for being uh, slightly long, and uh, I'm certainly thank you for the attention. I am ready to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. You can maybe have some real. <laughs> so, do we have questions for Mark?